Ready to roll? All right. Well, thank you all for coming to uh, see our presentation about groundwater of uh, the Shasta Valley. My name is Steve Hill. I'm with the Shasta Valley and Resource Conservation District. Um, others of us are here from the Resource Conservation District, Bill Hirsch and Adrian Garialdi and Dave Webb. And uh, I had to start off with a picture that uh, Shasta Valley, of course, is very scenic, right? And I had to start off with a picture from my backyard, <laughs> looking across. It's Highway 3 right, right in front there, and that's Anderson Grade back there. I live at Montero Estates. Beautiful spot. Um, so we'll be talking about the Shasta Valley. I was kind of hoping this was going to work. Doesn't look like it's going to do that. So, probably oh, yeah, yeah. Doesn't have that kind of rain. Okay. So, we're here to talk. This is out my front yard. <laughs> I love it up here. It's very scenic. Anyway, we're, we're here to talk about groundwater in the, in the Shasta Valley. Um, what uh, we find here is that while we're in a rural area, we don't have the service of a lot of urban areas, right, for a city or metropolitan water system. And a great many of us rely on groundwater for, uh, in order to uh, survive and thrive in this valley. Even as a small homeowner, I mean, I have a one-acre lot, but I have a, I have a well uh, to support my <coughs> home. Um, and that's true for at least 40% of the people who live in the Shasta Valley. Now, normally our water comes from the sky, or it comes from surface water that we take advantage of and we tap into, or if that's in lower supply than we need or not available, we go to the ground where we hope it's there. Now, I just wanted to say a little bit about this, our, the Resource Conservation District that we're working with a lot of partners in, in uh, uh, agencies. Our role really is to try to help landowners and agriculturalists to uh, be able to manage through the, um, the bureaucracy uh, and, and to thrive uh, in the valley. So if you have an issue with you know, the, a conflict over the possible uh, use of your of resources uh, in the uh, Shasta Valley, uh, give us a call, and the NRCS also, uh, we can be friendly to you and help you. Um, well, we have contacts with all these and more agencies. If I had one to show the agriculturalists, if we had a logo for our, our ranchers and our farmers, I'd put it up there really big, right in the middle. <laughs> in the Shasta, our resource conservation, Conservation District is not tax support, at least not direct. We don't have a, a regular tax base. Uh, we survive on uh, grants and funding that's made available to us, perhaps from donations or s small amounts from fundraisers. But by and large, it's from grants and donations. And we use that to leverage with uh, landowners to get projects done for their benefit. Um, in this case, we were working with the Department of Water Resources in order to be able to look at the information that's been done in the studies of groundwater so that we may be able to help put it together so it would be available for people to use and to study to make decisions about how, uh, how they should be using their water or what, what we might need to do in order to make it, uh, uh, in order to keep it available in the future. Now, why is there this interest in groundwater? Well, the state is making us be interested. The uh, state of California has the overall uh, authority over the uh, resources, and they have, they have delegated that down to the county. So the county of Siskiyou has the uh, responsibility to regulate uh, the, uh, and to monitor the um, use of groundwater in, in its county. Um, okay, go ahead. I say just a little bit about how the water gets there and how much gets there. It's kind of like a 
bank account. I mean, we I think it's pretty clear that you can only take out what's there in the first place. You may have a reserve, but if you take out more than gets replenished, then uh, you eventually will start to have problems. Well, it all starts with uh, the water cycle. This is, I also teach, by the way, I teach integrated science at Wairika High School, so this is one of the subjects that I teach them. So you get my lesson. Uh, the, it all starts with the water cycle. So I think this is pretty basic knowledge to us that, uh, you know, water enters the atmosphere as a vapor uh, from the oceans, and lakes, and rivers, uh, and from transpiration from trees. And as it goes up, it condenses, gets chilled, works its way across the landscape, and it, especially in the higher elevations, will be dropped as precipitation. Rain, and snow, and sleet, and hail, and maybe held <coughs> to the, holding on to the mountains as even glaciers. Out of that, you can see there's a little arrow to the, let's see if this works, a little arrow here. <coughs> it worked in reversal. <laughs> But there is that little arrow that's down there that shows groundwater. So water will percolate through the, through the surface layers of the soil and enter into what we call the groundwater system. Now how much is held there and how fast it moves or how available it is to take out of the ground all has to do with the soil type that's in the ground at that location. The USGS has, has uh, determined that it's approximately 1.7% of the water that falls from the sky to the ground enters into the groundwater system. 1.7%. Seems like kind of a small number, doesn't it? Means if you have 100 inches of rain, 1.7 inches of that will go underground. Is, is that for Siskiyou specifically? That's or? their average. <laughs> so I don't think they've said any specifically for Siskiyou. I have no doubt, but that it's higher in some places and lower in others. Because there are some places where, I mean, we can see where water falls into the ground and it might be heavy clay and it just sits there. On the other hand, if it's sand or, or gravel, right on through. So I'm sure it, it's not exactly 1.7 everywhere, but that's what they said is the average. That's national average? Yes, I've read somewhere else that it's uh, over the world that it's certainly under 2%. But even if we took the 2%, it ain't So here's what we're getting to fall on our county. These, this outer black line is the watershed boundary. So any water that falls outside of that line will go into some other basin or watershed. So to the, to the west of us, that means uh, uh, Scott Valley. To the south of us, Sacramento Valley, Sacramento River System, Butte Valley, and so forth. So all we're getting into our account is what's in the center of that valley. And if you look at it uh, from Montague down to Gazelle, those numbers are pretty small. Five or 10%, I mean five or 10 inches of rain per year average. It does get pretty good, pretty significant um, as you move south or certainly to the east where the, where the mountains are a little higher and they could kind of wring a little bit of that uh, water out especially, of course, around Mount Shasta, which is so high, where it may be up to 60 or 70 inches. Okay? Well, one thing about groundwater, if you, if you want to tap into the groundwater system that's there, uh, your use of groundwater is a property right, and you have very few exceptions to that. Uh, responsibility to regulate groundwater rests with the county who reaffirmed for us that their priority is health and safety issues in, in our county. Um, they are doing some monitoring, but uh, by and large, uh, their, their priority is health and safety at this time. Um, if you wanted to drill a well, all you need to do is fill out the permit, pay about 200, I think it's $246 currently for a domestic well and get a contractor to, to do the drilling for you and the county will give you a permit. And they'll come and, and they'll, they'll regulate for you know, the seal and so forth. They want to make sure it's safe. Whether or not you actually get water you can use, either in quality or quantity, is your luck. So if, if you drill your well and you don't get water 
at 200 feet, well, you can try drilling it to 400 feet or 600 feet. It's your luck. So, and, and they can't really, they don't really have, to my knowledge, nobody really has any records to say that this is a good place better, better than that. So, it's property right. You can drill, but it's your luck. Now, elsewhere in California, there have been some issues with overdraft. Overdrafting is, hey, just like the checking account term, right? It costs you if you <laughs> overdraft. The thing is, uh, if you go to a bank and you overdraft, they may put some money in behind it, right? They'll charge you a fee. But you know what? If you overdraft in, in, uh, in, in our water supply, um, that might also happen. Uh, that what we term overdrafting here doesn't necessarily mean the well has gone dry. But what it means is that you are taking more out of it than is getting replenished. Okay, I have a question with the previous slide. Sure. Um, the map, those records were 60 years old. Is it the same that it, um, today? Well, I mean, are those pretty accurate for now? or? Well, I, I haven't ha had a chance to see, and that's one of the things we were looking at with the report that we were, that's being completed now. Uh, when I put this together, this was what I had available. I don't think that it would be a whole lot different today. Um, some of the numbers may be different. Dave, can you comment? We used that older data because back then, every post office, a lot of schools, every governmental building tended to have a weather station. And so we had good, dense weather coverage for the Shasta Valley. Now it's pretty sparse, and everything is modeled. And the models may or may not be real. So relying on <coughs> real-world data seemed better than relying on model data until we get better real-world data. My sense is that if you were able to put it all together, you might see that it varies a little bit from place to place. But I'll bet that the basic concept of where the water is falling in the abundances, relatively at least, is probably pretty close. This is also, since I shared with you a couple of beautiful slides from my backyard, I'll share with you another one. This is uh, my well. Now I drilled the well before I could put my house on it. I had to prove that I had water in order to get the building permit. Well, I had water. I got I had the well drilled, got a building permit. Uh, and five years later, the well failed. Production failed. It collapsed. It was a problem with the uh, construction of the well that ultimately led to its demise. So another well driller, this is a and well driller out of, uh, well drilling out of uh, Hornbrook, uh, Mr. Russell Tweedy, he really knows his stuff. And he was able to salvage my well. So he found out that, you know, replaced casings, he had to replace voids and things like that. But he managed to salvage my well. So. The bad news was that I had a problem with the well. Uh, the county came out and they were concerned about <coughs> the, safety, the safety from the well, but they weren't concerned about you know, whether I'd get water or what I would have to do with the well. Um, but the good news is that I got my well back and I got water and every life is good again. But when it wasn't, when I turned on the tap and I had no water, wow. It, no, I mean, I, I had, I was saying, how can I live in my house? And for those of you, it gave me a sense that for those of you who are, who are not just living off the water for your house, but also for your livelihood, and the groundwater becomes sort of your water of last resort, perhaps, uh, this can get panic time. So I became very concerned, and that's one of the reasons why I'm pretty passionate about this subject, is because it's kind of near and dear, because I came real close to the reality of not having Home. We talk about, you know, the uh, plenishing and replenishing the water. Uh, the nice thing about the, uh, the water cycle is it's a cycle. And you can take water away, but it gets replenished. However, it's not endless. If everything like these top lines up here, this is, these are all, this is all information from the Sacramento Valley. And I share this with you because the Sacramento Valley has got some major problems that has drawn the attention of the state of California, which is making them put pressure on our counties to do a stronger, tighter, better job of, uh, of managing or regulating. 
So we're, we're looking at what's ahead. Uh, and that is in the San Joaquin Valley and Southern Valleys. You can see in the Northern Valleys, these lines of water are pretty uh, stable. The ones down here for uh, the Tulare Basin, uh, especially, uh, is uh, they're very dark. They're, they're not only the dark lines, but they're going down south. You can see, though, that where uh, the wet year comes, water comes, it replenishes. But as, as consumption exceeds what goes in, the water table is going down. So you may find that a well that worked at 100 feet now has to go 200 feet, and then 400 feet. Okay, you just have to keep going. How far can you go before there's nothing? Okay, that's the concern. Or you get salt. Or you get salt. Or you get some other contaminants. Or, or as we'll see too, from uh, the way water moves underground, it may be that you know you'll get contamination coming from other places. This is what's really kind of gotten the attention of the state. And there was a... Yeah, I'm going backwards. You gotta go the other way. Other way. I'm trying. <laughs> it's, something's, something's happened and it's... It's, uh, it's the arrow, on, it's the other arrow. It's the other arrow. Oh, okay. That'll work. Oh. Gotcha. Um, yeah, the arrow's working. <clears throat> okay. There we go. So here's an example. Uh, this is a classic picture, and it's been taken some time ago, but it's no nonetheless very dramatic. Here in Northern California, I know going along the Eel River, I saw markers that said where the floodwaters were, like in 1964. You probably, many of you have probably seen something like that. Here in the in the uh, in, in, near Mendota. Uh, in San Joaquin Valley, um, they have a marker that shows where the land was in 1925, <coughs> the land was in 1955 and 1977, and I'd like to get one that's more current. I, don't, I, I would be very shocked if it was higher, <laughs> because it's only going to go lower. What does that represent? That represents what we just saw from that graph, draft, <coughs> overdraft. Okay, where they're taking more out than is going in. And the soils there are kind of a clay soil. And so as water is taken away from clay, it dries and shrinks. I certainly see, I see that in my backyard in this Montague glue. Okay, when it gets wet, it expands. When it's, when, when it's uh, dry, it, it contracts. Um, probably would make uh, great adobe if I worked at it. But that's kind of the principle here, is this kind of uh, uh, soil condition contracted as water was taken away. This not only has a problem, it's a problem for the agriculturalist who's taking water out, but what about everybody else that lives in the area? When you have uh, sewer lines that are supposed to go downhill, now they got to go uphill. Water lines. Infrastructure, roads, houses, what's going to happen to your houses, the ground around it settles that much. Uh, so this is, this is something that's a concern, not just for the people who are drafting and drawing the water, but also for the whole community. Um. Yes? Yeah, uh, Bill first made me answer this question, but I mean, you know, the, the aquifer here in the Central Valley, I mean, that's sediment, ocean bottom, stuff like that. That, that collapse, well, we're looking at a volcanic structure plus its subduction zone, right? And so isn't, if anything, isn't that, that plate that's sliding in there, isn't that necessarily maybe forcing, I mean, we don't, there's not really any problem of us, yes. of, of yeah. us sinking. And well, I, our, yeah, and I, I'm glad you make that point because I don't think <coughs> any of us, looking at the data or information, that any of us think that that's going to be a problem that we're likely to see. Yeah, here. but when you're talking about lines, sewer lines running back. Exactly. But that's also what's drawn the interest of the people in Sacramento. That's what they see with what can happen with groundwater overdrafting. Yeah. That will lead them likely, as we we'll talk about a little bit later, that may lead them likely to come to conclusions about how to manage groundwater. Okay, I see where you're that would be different than, than would work 
publicly yeah. viable here at the city council. Okay, but that's a. I'm glad you brought that up because I did intend to bring that. Up. Yeah. Uh, underground, when you when you're taking water from underground, um, you get created what's known as a, a cone of depression. At least while you're taking the water, you know, the cone of depression uh, is kind of like. I mean, we've all had milkshakes, right? I'd like to have one right now, actually. <laughs> Put a uh, straw in the middle, and you suck at it, and you know how the the uh, milkshake sort of curves down to the middle, down to the pipe. Well, that's exactly the type of thing that happens underground, we found out. So in the top view up here, before heavy pumping, it shows a, it shows a scene where you've got a couple of domestic wells, a small well, with an irrigation well kind of in the middle. Uh, you can see a cone of depression on the well to the left. It's not very much. Um, because it's a small well. Maybe it's only drafting five or ten gallons a minute, something like that. But nonetheless, each well will have a cone of depression. Now, how broad that goes, how deep it goes, uh, will depend on probably soil quality and how much water is drafted. Um, in the center, it shows the effect of irrigation, where you're taking lots of water. So you can anticipate that the cone of depression would be bigger. The point here to make, though, isn't so much that it's bigger or that it's bad. The point to make is that it can have effects beyond, uh, you know, somewhat beyond, and it can affect neighbors. Uh, as you can see, in this case, while the drafting is being done, the cone of depression has occurred such that it's extended out far so that it's actually affecting a couple of other wells. Now, it happens that my little neighborhood <laughs> has another example that is exactly this. There was, I live in the Montero States, probably most of you, or maybe all of you know about it. There's about 40 lots and a half of them roughly are, are built on, uh, one acre. Everybody has their own well. Now some of the properties have been there for a while, and other people move in and build up, which we encourage. But in one case, there was, but we don't have very great well uh, production numbers, so it's like five or ten gallons a minute is pretty normal. Mine is about 10. Uh, so many of the people, in order to be, they get such small amounts of water that they have to keep a reserve tank so they have water for their needs. But one of the first people who settled there had a small, had a small well, or at least it, it was producing about five gallons a minute, and they had a reserve tank. And they were living pretty well within their means, like we all tend to do. And uh, they didn't extend their landscaping any more than they could manage with the water that they were taking from their well. Lo and behold, 15 or so years later, the lot next door gets built up. Neighbor comes in from the Central Valley, water, water use, pretty used to lawns and gardens and things like that. Comes in, builds their house, puts in their well, puts in extensive landscaping, bingo. As soon as they're running it, the neighbor, the first person that was there, goes dry. So now they were amicable, so they managed to work it out by negotiating. Like, okay, when are you using it? How much are you using it? Can you time your use and so forth? And so they're managing to live within, you know, their means and as good neighbors. But that's just an example, a very small example, but it's an example of what can happen uh, with the cone of depression. Now, when you stop taking the water, of course, it's going to start filling back in. But how fast or how high, you, you know, is we don't know what the subsurface is. So it, it could take some time and affect people for a while. Um, this is sort of a generic look. I mean, this isn't showing exactly how it, there's not going to be a lake of water that's underneath the draft. It's, mm -hmm. it's more likely going to be in what we call aquifers, that is in layers, because the soil will have probably built up with some relatively impervious layers, some, uh, <laughs> some layers that will carry water and then another impervious <coughs> layer. So it'll tend to be in, in lines. So if you drill down, you may actually, and what this happened when they drilled my well down, they came through probably about five different layers, five different aquifers. Did many people see the news just a week or so ago here in the wine country where exactly your diagram is what's happening? Really? It was on the evening news in the wine country. New vineyards went in, started pumping heavy, neighbors had run out of water. Sure, sure. And, um, and then what? Who has, who has priority over the water? 
And, and how does this get sorted out? Well, it's a civil case. So what happens is that there, if there's no, if there's no regulation going on, it's, it's going, you're going to have to make your case, prove it, and go to court and try to get some restriction or some, some priority, some right for the water. And you'll have to win it, just kind of like they did here, I guess, years ago when they, you know, adjudicated the rivers and so forth. People had to prove their water and, and go to court and try to fight it out and work it out. Pretty messy, and very expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's that's sort of one of the things that happens with water. And this, it seems like this cone of depression is going to. I'm going to show it again in a couple of different ways. Here is uh, in a natural condition where you have the confining unit, like I just said, you know how the aquifers work out. So water will go down until it kind of hits a hard layer and is relatively impervious, and then it'll start to flow with gravity typically, and the uh, pressure on the top will kind of move it around. So it can actually rise above because of pressure underneath, kind of like a hose. So at any rate, here's, here's kind of a normal natural condition. You can see how the uh, water is uh, penetrating in, down into the water table. Um, the water table is basically where you <coughs> dig down and you find um, water. Okay? Uh, above that, there'll be water in the soil, but it's where you actually find kind of a layer of water is the top of the water table. So it goes down into the water table and then starts to flow. You could, I think, I, I look at this and I say this could be the Shasta River, for example. But it could be almost any creek or river, I presume. So water is moving through and then comes out into the stream. And if it's flowing in this way, what will happen is that you'll have a gaining reach of the stream. That is, water will actually be coming out in springs to feed the stream. So the stream will actually get whatever quality is in the water, whatever um, cold or hot is in the water, uh, will come back into the stream and make it rise a little. The next, the next slide shows, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a cone of depression uh, if you have a pumping well uh, and you insert it into that same stream. Depending on how much, how close, I mean, there's a lot of pressure, <coughs> but depending on, one of the possibilities is that water can actually start flowing from the stream into the, uh, into the well. And so where you had in the groundwater flow, the normal <coughs> groundwater flow may be interrupted. And, uh, and, and not go to the stream. So where you, in this first slide where we saw this had a, a gaining stream, um, now you have a losing stream. Okay. What does the word, what does confining mean? Confining, it means that water will, tent, will stay above that. So it's kind of like a tabletop. Mm -hmm. So if you put sand and gravel over here and you poured water on it, it would go down to this and then it would tend to flow up. Now, this is where one of the issues where the county is really concerned is about contamination of water. That's why we see also, even in Wairika, around the, around the uh, uh, drains, you'll see these signs, you know, this water goes to the river, so protect it. Don't throw oil and things like that. Is that you know, this is a problem, too, around uh, places where there's been uh, military bases, for example, uh, train depots. Uh, <clears throat> Wherever they've used a lot of uh, uh, chemicals, uh, it can get into the ground and flow in and uh, contaminate the water. It's one of the reasons why uh, it's gotten so expensive to operate a, a service station, right? Because they used to have single wall tanks that lost an unbelievable amount of gasoline into the ground. Uh, it not only was uh, expensive, I presume, because of the loss of the fuel, but it also put gasoline into the ground that became contaminant potentially for water. So the state has, you know, made double tanks required inspections and things like that to protect our, our water supplies. Okay. Now, if this were carried over a long term, and I would presume not just one well, but a whole host of them, you might get enough groundwater taken from the stream that at least it, it may affect the riparian zone, that is the vegetation that's along the stream, that, re, that, that is used to water, you know, the willows and the cottonwoods and things like that. So those could be affected in the riparian zone. So there is a potential environmental effect too in this. And then another way to look at it would be, and 
these are from the, uh, uh, this is the concept uh, that was shown by the USGS, um, is that here's an example, and again, this is a pretty generic one. There's no lake of water likely to be like this, but uh, you'll see uh, where water would enter the stream pretty much in the same fashion that we just showed. And it would be a gaining stream. It's very healthy and natural. You can see in this slide. Add a couple of, uh, add some, some heavy pumping, and it starts to make it to change. <coughs> At least in this area, you may have water certainly mm -hmm. leaving the stream if you were to continue <coughs> that. And we're not seeing, I don't think we're seeing anything like this here, but this is kind of the theory of what, what happens. Uh, is that uh, it could continue uh, to such a point, and it depends on how much water is there, how fast it gets replenished, and so forth, and the soil types. But there is a potential for it to become, start to become disconnected from the stream, so that your stream becomes either somewhat seasonally dry or um, almost permanently dry. We've seen streams like this. And, and this can happen not just from pumping water from wells, but there's natural situations that can cause the stream to drive to. Okay. Well, let's take a look at what our valley looks like. Um, this is, and it's exactly what he said, we, aren't, we were built up in our valley differently than the Central Valley. And it's very complex here. And that if there's one thing I really hope that you get to appreciate here is just how complex it is. Um, we have uh, the Klamath Mountains to the west. We have the Cascade Mountains, which are of volcanic origin, to the east. Down the middle is, if you look at it, kind of this brown layer, sideways, turn your head a little, says volcanic debris avalanche. Right down the middle. Okay? And uh, you can see the streams too, and how they flow pretty much along the, uh, along through and around and by through the kind of the, the gaps in the in the debris avalanche. Uh, there's also something else pointed out here: uh, Pluto's cave basalt, which is very important to the Shasta River and, mm. and to our water system, and that's volcanic. So this is our valley. Now, looking on the outer region, outer range of, of lines, that's our, that's our watershed. And because of the nature of the geology and how it was created and, and events that have happened over the last, particularly in fairly recent time, um, it has created what we have come to realize is about eight different sub-areas of our groundwater system. So it's not, it's not a simple one one view fits all. Um, each of these areas is fairly distinct in the way it flows water, how much you can get out of it, um, the soil types, the water quality. Um, there are distinct characteristics. Now, to some degree, of course, they're all going to be um, interconnected. We don't know exactly how or where those interconnections are. Uh, at least, um, I haven't heard of it. Um, but, so there's a lot we don't know, but what we do know is it's very complicated. So how did it get to be like this? Well, it's kind of started exactly as he said, from the uh, plate tectonics action. Um, you've got your um, oceanic plate, collides with the continental plate, which is kind of floating on top. Oceanic plate goes underneath, and as it does, subduction, it uh, gains in, in heat and from, the, and from the pressure, and it's carrying a little water with it too. Remember, it was in the ocean. It's carrying water, and it gets to a certain point, and that heat and pressure and water build up such that it releases itself as volcanoes or volcanic activity. You could consider that to be like Mount Shasta. It's interesting that if you look at that cascade range, it's rather like a, a line. So there's a point where it goes and it stays and it reaches that critical combination of heat and pressure and water and gets released. And that's pretty much up and down the coast with 
that same. Now it might be a little further inland or a little less further inland depending on a lot of conditions we don't know about, but it's pretty much aligned. Once it's expended itself, it still will keep floating on and moving underneath, but you won't see the volcanic activity that you saw here. Go ahead. Go. Now, something else too. I've kind of thought that uh, what, I, what I read is that the Klamath Mountains actually began as island arcs. So if you live in the Klamath Mountains and you thought, you know, wistfully how it would be to live on an island somewhere, well, you probably are. Uh, island arcs, little islands created uh, during, associated with the subduction and so forth, created some islands. Those get carried on that tractor beam, crushed into the coast, and become and then we have the Cascade, which would be like the Mount Shasta, the Klamath Mountains, and right there is the Shasta Valley. There's the most Modoc Plateau, but you can see there's not, you're not seeing much uh, in the way of volcanic activity uh, further east. Okay, so let's take another look at this. There's the line, it's not as distinct as I'd like it to be, but it shows, you know, basically the Klamath Mountains to the, to the west. And the line showing the Cascade Mountains to the east, that is the volcanic. And in the middle is this debris avalanche. Well, it turns out that um, Crandall, uh, USGS, um, wrote about and discovered and researched and wrote about uh, the uh, uh, volcanic collapse that occurred of a, of a prior Mount Shasta. So up until about 350,000 approximately years ago, uh, there was Mount Shasta, but it collapsed. Go ahead. The Mount Shasta that's there now built upon, built, rebuilt pretty much on the same spot. When, when that mountain collapsed, it collapsed apparently with a great amount of water. Whether that was as a, had a crater lake, whether it was glaciers heated, we don't know. We weren't there. But it apparently had a, hot, a lot of water. When it collapsed in kind of sheets, as he says, um, it, the force of it came northward, spreading out towards Mont Grenada, Montague, all, all the way, well, as you'll see in a minute, all the way up even uh, uh, to the uh, to Black Mountain in uh, North Carolina. These little hills that we see are remnants of that volcanic mountain that was there, the previous Mount Shasta. You can see between those hills, it's pretty flat, and if you look at those, it, and also the way they were carried so far <coughs> north, um, and looking at another uh, uh, overview map gives it the uh, distinct uh, uh, notion that uh, it was carried uh, maybe as a kind of almost a slurry and it even came around hills that were existing and so forth. So if we look, yeah, and here is not far from here, you probably recognize this spot, but here's, here's one of them near us, with the present Mount Shasta, which I hope stays just where it is. <laughs> Yeah, this is a, a map of the, kind of call it the footprint, it almost looks like it actually, of the debris avalanche. And you can see around Steamboat Mountain and so forth that it kind of floated around. And there's even some places up, I think, uh, uh, north and east of Montague where it looks like some of the rock may have been actually carried up, possibly by water that, that, uh, uh, that receded to leave it higher than the normal uh, level. So it shows how, how far it went across the valley. And not only did it go that far, but it, as we saw with the hills left behind, it was a pretty violent act. Um, and, uh, it, and churned and, and boiled and, and just dug, dug up the ground that was there. And any aquifers, any nice little sand and gravel alluvium that was laid would have been churned up with it. 
and on top and replacing it or on top was uh, now this all this debris kind of compacted and this debris from this avalanche doesn't it, it, it's, it doesn't carry water, it doesn't hold water, it doesn't carry water as well as the uh, normal uh, alluvial uh, soil and, and sediments that you get, mm -hmm. you know, from, from the older mountains. So it has affected the, uh, the groundwater. Not only that, it's, it's bisected, it's cut right down through the heart of our system. So everything is sort of cut out. And it's really uh, an important characteristic for how it affected the Shasta River, how it affected the flows of water through the valley, and, and kind of cut up our system into its sub-basins. I think we can already get a sense that this is not the same kind of system of the Central Valley. <laughs> right. So let's look at how, how we're using how, our water, uh, some of the numbers and charts. It, here we can see of course, we know that the valley is, we're, we're, we're not growing so much in terms of total population, but remember, so many of us, because we have so few municipal systems, so many of us have to drill our own wells. I mean, 40 acres of, 40 acres of lots, right, in my little subdivision, that's 40 lots, 40 acres, 40 lots, and each one has a one or more well. Because when they only draw like five acre, five gallons a minute, and they want more, they're they're drilling more. They're drilling two, three wells in order to try to get enough water for themselves. Um, that may not affect the total amount of water significantly, but it does mean that a lot of wells are being drilled, and that's just my area. So, um, but you can see that here the green lines are the domestic wells that are going in, and down below it's more of the irrigation. Um, this ends at 2001. I think that it's safe to say that the trend has continued. I mean, wells continue to be put into service. Very few are taken out of service. So we can see from that trend that there are, are there's going to probably be more pressure uh, from the number of wells you show domestic and irrigation, is there anything as far as industrial? Like, you know, water bottling, water plants? And things well, like that? I think that's another good question. Uh, because actually, my own sense, when, when I've looked into water bottling plants, <laughs> um, they can consume a lot of water. And the other thing about a water bottling plant is, where does that water go? It goes out of your watershed. It goes out of your system. So. Um, to me, that's also a concern because it's just as if we put a pipe into the Sacramento River, you know, carrying it over, it, truckload by truckload. But it can turn out to be a lot. Um, actually, it's interesting that many of the bottled bottled water plants um, are even drawing off of municipal systems, huh. and they're you know doing the uh, reverse osmosis and adding a little bit of, uh, you know, flavoring minerals and so forth, and then they call it, they, they may not call it spring water, but, you know, that's what it is. In Sacramento, people have been, you know, arguing, I know that they're putting in bottling plants in, in South Sacramento because they can just get it from a fire hydrant, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the other funny thing is, to me, um, that the uh, uh, bottling plants, the water that you get in a bottle of water doesn't have to go through the same rigors as the water that comes from your water tap. So they can sell you water that would might not be of a quality that would work for, you know, your that you would accept in, in a water tap, or that the, the county or the, or a city would accept as quality water. I think, I don't think that there's any, I haven't heard of any instances where they're giving you bad water, but I did look into this once and I was, there was, when I lived in Lake County, and uh, they uh, were looking at trying to get rid of tertiary waste water, tertiary treated waste water. And the only place they could put it because of the nature of that is, they couldn't really put it in the ground, you can only sprinkle so much on the ground. They wanted to put it and send it down the, the uh, Cache Creek. 
and people down in Cache Creek objected. <clears throat> so one of the real possibilities would be put some minerals in it, put it in a bottle, and sell it on a shelf. Oh, yeah. You could do that. <laughs> they did it. What they actually did, I think it was pretty ingenious, was they got a, a piping system that fed to geysers just uh, about 30 miles south <coughs> that needed water. They were geysers or, you know, hot volcanic uh, masses underground, put water in it, water hits steam, comes up, can run turbines. So they were running out of water for the geysers. So this was a pretty ingenious way to, to reuse water that nobody else seemed to want. But your question, the point about bottled water, I think, is a concern. Yeah, there's water. What are the cumulative other? I don't understand that. The agriculture and domestic, I understand. What well, the there could be. Um, you know, if you, I look just down the street, and we got, um, uh, what is it, uh, the um, uh, Shasta Vet Forest Products. They use a lot of water. They bring in. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful company. Love it. Glad it's down the street. But they have, you know, lumber, they pile in stacks, you know, in rows and rows and rows, and they they sprinkle it day and night, year round. In fact, it's gotten so cold sometimes that the sprinklers have actually stopped and you know, you can see it's almost like a roof or building over it, all solid water. Uh, That's wait a minute. That's yes. timber products that mm -hmm. is doing that. That's mm -hmm. not Shasta Forest products. Yeah. No, it's, is it timber products? Yes, yes. Okay. it's timber products. Okay, it's well, not the same lot. Timber no, products. No, it's not the same. Well, they're next door, right? Yeah, yeah okay. but it's not okay. the same. Thanks for correcting. But nonetheless, I guess my point is that water is, yes, water is being used for uh, industrial purposes or, or for commercial purposes. Uh, I don't know that there's a lot of water being used, except where it is being used, it's probably locally strong. To answer Steve's question, for this sort of data, we're pretty much at the mercy of the data source, which is well drillers reports. Mm -hmm. So a well driller might not check the right box, and so a domestic well might be called an other well or an agricultural well, or he might be drilling a monitoring well, like at a dump. We've got a number of wells at dumps. He might be drilling an other well, which might be like uh, near a gas station to recirculate the groundwater through a, a, a resin filter trying to strain the gasoline out that's gotten in the groundwater. Or it might be just an exploratory hole. So it's hard to know what that other category is. The only really good news is, is that there aren't many of them and they aren't growing. So what they were, what they are, Unless you went through, got the old well drillers reports out, and went back to the site and tried to figure it out, there's no way to know. Okay. Some of those wells may be dry too, right? I mean, your cumulative yeah. number is always going to go up. Perhaps. Unless they take it out of service. Unless you abandon, you know. And that's one of the concerns also, and I think <coughs> because a well, when you're taking water out, of course, uh, is likely to keep the environment and everything cleaner. If it is not being used, then anything that can go into it can contaminate the groundwater pretty quick and pretty easily. But when it's taken out of service, does that show up on your graph? Is there a way? Well, it, it should, but I don't think it would be a very significant number. You know, to destroy a well means they have to seal it and treat it in certain ways. It's much cheaper and easier just to leave it. <laughs> Cap it. That's yeah, I'll, check, I'll check on that. It's thing. illegal. You're only supposed to be able to do that for a few years and then you have to do something. The water from timber products now, logs, go, eventually goes back into the ground? Well, I don't know. I don't know their, how, how they've set up, whether they put some layers underneath the impervious layers or not. I presume that they, they I, I, it's, they're a good business. I, I presume yeah. that they're doing what they need to do. Yeah, I think yeah. they have paving out there. Yeah, they right. they paving and they repump the water. Yeah, I think that's what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I, it's my understanding that they do recirculate the water that they use. Yeah, so it's pretty efficient. I, I'm not too concerned about that. If you on uh, a previous graph, yes. If you overlaid a graph of average daily flows in the Shasta River over the same time period. A declining trend in water? In average stream flows in the Shasta River. In other words, is 
If you see the number of whales increase, yes. do you observe shrimp flows decreasing? I don't think we have that data. Do I don't think we've ever tried to do it on an annualized <coughs> basis. Uh, we've, we've looked a little bit at more of the dry season basis summertime, and we, don't, we did not see a trend downward. But I haven't ever looked at sort of annual water yield for the entire watershed, which you'd probably have to do to capture groundwater, since there may be a lag from when it gets used to when it shows up in the river. And we can try to look into that for you. And what's the relative, I mean, the number of domestic wells is obviously higher, but I mean, if you graph, like, well output, you know, the agricultural wells would be obviously a lot more. That's what's, true. What's sort of the, I mean, we, we're talking about orders of magnitude of difference. <coughs> Dave, do you know that? Again, we're at the mercy of the well drillers. And in their driller's log, they may put down a well yield. They don't necessarily tell you what size pump they put on the well. So it might test 3,000 gallons a minute. That doesn't necessarily mean they put a 3,000 gallon a minute pump on it. We really have no way to answer that question. There's no data available. So you have no way of knowing how much water people actually use? No. Not really, no. The only, you could yeah, approach it backwards by looking at what's being irrigated with groundwater and trying to develop sort of a water budget based on water consumptive use by plants. But that wouldn't tell you if they were over overwatering what became of the excess water, whether it went back to groundwater, or whether it ran off the surface and joined surface water. So you could guesstimate it, but you couldn't know for sure what the numbers are. There's no data. There are sort of ways to make estimates of water use. I mean, by the type of crops that are being grown and how many acres, and and, uh, and also by uh, houses typically. Um, you know, a household of four will, I think, I believe the average is about an acre foot a year uh, that one will use. But, you know, it depends on, the, on, on a lot of other things. I mean, how much landscaping or if they're doing any, any planting or anything else, too. So there is way, there are ways to get sort of estimates, but one of the things that if you, if you drill a well, it's going to say right on there on your permit, it says confidential information. And that means that I have my well record information that the well driller has provided for me from when he uh, drilled the well. Um, I can choose to share it or not. If I don't want to, sh I, if they, if anybody wants to to access that information, they have to get my permission first. So if if I were to call the well driller, um, which I did, and said, "Hey, would you be able to help us with this?" Um, data uh, from wells you've drilled. He said, I'd be happy to, but I'd have to get permission from each and every one of the well drillers before I could share that with you. Okay. So it's not necessarily that easy to, to get either. At least. Um, but there are ways that we can get sort of general averages and so forth. So this is one look at it. Uh, the other is we can also look at, for those eight eight sub-areas is where are, where are the uh, well numbers? And uh, so we can see by those sub-areas, and there's Gazelle Grenada, a lot of domestic wells here, uh, more uh, irrigation wells in, in this area too uh, than the other areas. Pluto's Cave Basalt has a, uh, is number two as far as irrigation wells. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, and you can see uh, in other areas there's Fewer irrigation wells. Montague has fewer because, of course, they get water from the irrigation district. Okay, but this kind of gives an idea of where um, our wells are, and something of an idea, I think, about where the water use is coming from. Mm -hmm. This one will look at the irrigated water in terms of uh, acres, groundwater. Um, here is uh, total. Uh, surface water 43,000 and uh, water 8,300, so it's about 22% roughly, uh, 20 to 25 percent of the water used uh, totally for our uh, valley is, is coming from groundwater. It's not uniformly used that way though, and that relates, of course, to those sub-areas we talked about, and each how each one is different, and how it not only uh, 
as a source of water, how it holds water, and how easily it releases the water. Um, we can see the number one number is Pluto's cave basalt, the number two is Gazelle Grenada. So Gazelle Grenada is about, what, 40% or so? Uh, it comes from groundwater, and uh, Pluto's cave basalt is uh, greater than, more, more from groundwater than from surface water. And can we ask, is there an assumption that, that most of these irrigated acreages are either pasture or um, alfalfa? Hay or, or hay mix? Um, That's pretty much all people grow except for people like you. So, yeah, the, the vast majority of the irrigation is probably grass pasture and a little further back alfalfa, but very little else really. Cows. <laughs> yeah. Could you, could you explain <clears throat> the relationship of the surface water to the groundwater? Is that the soil? Yeah, I think actually that's a good question because that's I, I'm hoping to show a few slides that might help to give you a little insight into how that happens. We'll go back <laughs> to our map of the valley. Um, and here's our, our eight areas. And now we've seen that the two on either side of the debris flow, Gazelle Grenada and the Pluto's Cave of Salt, uh, on the east, east side, are the two that are providing a lot of water to, you know, especially for irrigation, right? Which is where the bigger numbers are. Down, cut through the middle is the debris flow. Um, recall too, and I think, I can't remember if I have the, maybe I have the over, overlay of the, go ahead to the next one, Bill. Oh no, uh, I was gonna say that, I think I'll show in a minute, another overlay that shows where the water is, and you can see that Gazelle Grenada, uh, Remember that first map, that precipitation map? And those, so, those lower corners seem to be where there was more water. So that's one reason why you would have more supply. Yes? The shading colors that we're seeing here, are those relevant to the or uh, brown and purple? Not, yeah, not really. I think just it's sort of like, well, the, there were colors that related, I think, to the rock formations and the rock types. And, that kind of, we kind of bleached those out a little bit to kind of highlight what our uh, area is. But uh, yeah, I believe those, those do have a meaning as far as the uh, type of formation that's, uh, that's found there. Okay, you see a line going across the top uh, from Wairika through Wairika East, Montague, and Little Shasta Valley. Uh, what I've done here is I've taken, there's, there's a lot more of these, but I took two as kind of representative to try to give you an idea of the cross-section of what is underground, what we, we think is underground. So, there's one cross-section up on the top that starts from there, and go ahead and go. And if we kind of put it together here, we'll see that this also corresponds the blue with the Klamath Mountains. Underneath, the, especially up north, uh, you find uh, what's called the Hornbrook Formation, which is kind of your bedrock. Uh, came up from the seabed, so if you drill into that, you tend to get more salty water, and I think that's what I'm drilled into. So, because um, up north it's it's there's it's it's closer to the surface. The light brown that's over on the top is going to be a little bit of that um, uh, free avalanche reached that far, and uh, then as you go over to the to the right, kind of the reddish brown will be your volcanic activity in the salt. And these, of course, lines down would be well, representing wells, where these are giving us some insights into what's uh, underground, not just in terms of what the soils are, but also a little bit about what the, uh, what the yields are from the wells. And up in this area, most of the wells, because of the nature of the formations underneath, like that Hornbrook formation does not hold or yield much water. Uh, most of the most of the wells there will yield from about one to twelve uh, gallons a minute, which is really not enough to sustain agriculture. Um, and you can see, go ahead, Bill. Steve, on, yes. On that, the surface uh, area there over on the right is that the Hornberg? The, it'd be the so green. It's the top layer. Yeah, the top layer would the top the light brown would be the uh, volcanic debris avalanche. What's the one over on the left? Then? On the left, the blue would be the Klamath Falls. No, no the green, the lighter colored one there on the 
about a third of the way over from the left of this picture. Let's see. It's not up there. Kind of lines up with what Rica looks like. Uh, let's see. Where it this right here? Yeah, right there. Okay, this is debris avalanche. Oh, well, that is true. That's a little debris avalanche, yeah. This is the Hornbrook Formation, the uh, volcanic. Okay. And, yeah. And in that area, you can see, too, that the um, avalanche actually came up just a little bit above this edge of the volcanic. So it's, it's pretty recent. Um, okay, go ahead. Why are so many of the wells in the Pluto cave basalt so much better, higher yielding than other areas? Are they fed directly from Mount Shasta through lava tubes? Or? It, well, yes, from Mount Shasta and also from the range uh, north of Mount Shasta, that is um, Mary's Peak, uh, Gooseneck, and Whaleback, which are also, you know, bringing out water. But the volcanics, the nature of the volcanic, um, the basalt, and I, I think we can show that a little bit more clearly for you too, is that it tends to have holes, gaps, cracks, and this can carry water pretty, pretty rapidly. And the Pluto's cave basalt also had caves. <laughs> and, and some of those, whether they collapsed and filled in, or whether they are still there, are uh, very good carriers for water, certainly. Yeah, so I just ran a couple of lines here. You Just to show kind of the yields that you get, the use. Okay, and the Montague. See, Montague is going to either be the uh, uh, debris avalanche, which doesn't yield much, uh, or the uh, Hornbrook, which does. Okay, Shasta Valley, the basalts can yield a little more. There's not much population up there. They have some surface water to work with, so there's not a lot of wells. But the yields are pretty, pretty good for that. Okay. Now, that, okay, right, right. <coughs> yeah, okay, now. Now cross-section across from Gazelle, where they is, just north of us here, through the debris flow. And we can see how our numbers are much higher wow. here. And as you can see, though, there's something else there, and that's the uh, there's an alluvial fan. So you've got the Klamath Range, uh, uh, and, uh, and and it's been there for a long time. The um, uh, this kind of soil and rock of you know sedimentary and metamorphic cracks and, and uh, erodes easily, and uh, and has built up a pretty good uh, alluvial fan at the base, and the alluvium can take water in, transport water pretty pretty uh, easily, and it's pretty easy to get out. If you were to take a handful of clay, like my backyard in the winter, and it'll be heavy and full of water, or you take a handful of uh, rock and sand in the other hand, it'll, it'll hold water too, but you may actually have more water in this clay, but you have a hard time getting it out. You can squeeze it, well, it'll, it'll just kind of ooze around, right? And here, it'll come out and move around pretty easily. But because of the nature of it, it might not actually hold as much water as this. But it's a whole lot easier to get out. And that's kind of what the alluvial fan will, will do, that kind of sediment layers, uh, nice sand and gravels, that will allow water to be moved pretty easily. It's also um, usually a little easier to drill a well into as well. So we'll see how some of these go out. Huh? We go fan. We see how numbers can drop. We go to something that's less permeable. They also have something to do with how many people are living there and trying to, to use it. But um, it's my sense is that looking at how wells have been drilled and where they've been drilled over the 150 years that people have been at this, they've been drilling where the water is and where they. Can Here's uh, the Pluto's Cave Basalt. Look at that. What are those numbers? I must have missed. Oh, these numbers are uh, acre feet. Irrigated I think acres. that's right. Irrigated, irrigated acres. acres. Irrigated acres. Excuse me. Irrigated acres from groundwater. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at Pluto's Cave. Uh, I uh, think I mentioned I, I teach at Wairika High School to science to uh, 
freshmen this year. Um, a couple of years ago, I was teaching a natural resources class for them, and I took some students out to take a look at Pluto's cave. So we could see these lava formations. Go ahead. It's just out off of uh, A12. Here's the entrance to the cave, and the thing I wanted to show here is, um, it's kind of striking. One thing, you can see they're wearing jackets, so it's kind of a chilly day. This was like early November, kind of, and, and it was chilly, there was a little bit of rain, there had been light rains for about a week, not much. You can see the ground is, is pretty dry, in fact, you could even kick up dust. Uh, but there was a little <coughs> bit of rain, and one of the things I wanted to look for <coughs> was water penetrating into the cave. Um, I was hoping to be able to show my students that, you know, one way that, you know, um, salts can penetrate into a cave and create stalactites and stalagmites. But obviously when I got in there, there's not enough water and not enough time for that to happen. But we did see actually water penetrate through the uh, roof of the cave. And the roof of the cave is probably about 12, where we were looking, it's probably, I'd say, 12 or so feet from the surface. So it actually, to me, it was quite remarkable that we saw water at all. We'll go ahead to the next one. But this is what we saw. You can see the cracks, and there's a little water there. Mm -hmm. In that light of precipitation, still, water managed to find its way that far um, through the rock. And you can see where it found its way, through the cracks. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at the Pluto's Cave basalts from the Cascade Ranges and remembering where the water comes from. We overlay that with our precipitation map. See where the where the water is mm -hmm. coming to the ground, and it's right there at the above the foot of the cave, which reaches down as far as Mount Shasta, and then uh, across up actually all the way, almost to Little Shasta. Okay. And when it comes down, it goes into the into that basalt, and then goes underground and <coughs> goes by gravity towards the center of our valley, where, when it hits the, the uh, volcanic debris avalanche, doesn't have a place to go, <coughs> except up. And this is uh, Little Springs on the historic Louis Ranch. And uh, of course, Big Springs, Little Springs, Old Wall Springs, and I'm sure a host of other unnamed springs are all feeding into the Shasta River. And you can see as how the Shasta, of course, will, will pick up the springs and you know, carry water from around and, and, and manages to meander its way through the, uh, uh, the volcanic debris gills and so forth. So it, the volcanic debris avalanche actually, and I guess this picture isn't probably the best one, but it does illustrate, I think, how the <coughs> volcanic debris avalanche does affect the course of the Shasta River. It, because of the nature of where the springs come out, that's going to be one of the big flows into the, into the river. And then, of course, uh, they'll follow it around to the same region. Okay. Now, water chemistry, just want to say something about that. It'll make its way through. Um, we see a lot of bicarbonates um, and uh, magnesium, sodium, calcium. <coughs> Uh, and some and some sulfates where there was you know especially where there's some underground volcanic activity that creates the sulfate, sulfates. So you see, by and large, it's a bicarbonate mix. The uh, the ions are are going to be you know varying according to where you are. Maybe some of the uh, origin um, they give it more calcium or more magnesium. Um, we also have some concerns in some areas for some of the chemicals that can be um, uh, harmful, like boron. I don't know if anybody, if there's any, any of that around here, but uh, there are a couple of places where I've heard that they're concerned about that. But anyway, uh, the uh, water chemistry is one of the things that probably could be studied further to give us more insights into how water is moving and how even how long it's staying underground. Um, perhaps, and, uh, and also uh, uh, something about um, what even gives us insights into how the rock formations are underneath. What's 
Sodium. Sodium. So we're trying to gather information, and most of this, this has come from looking at geology maps, David says, well drillers maps, water chemistry records, observing local issues and, and use, um, been gathering information and data, actually uh, talking to people like yourselves every time we come away with more insights and information. Um, and what we're looking for is now to kind of help provide you with some of the information about what that underground looks like that we just take for granted or don't know because it's under our feet and we can't see it. So now that you have a little bit of, you know, perhaps of uh, understanding of how it works in, in our valley, um, we're trying to figure out, okay, where are the issues that we should be studying and what should we do from here? So. Um, if you have uh, ideas or suggestions about things that we could do, um, areas that maybe should be looked at or issues, <coughs> if you know of, around you of you know, people that have had certain kinds of uh, experiences, whether it's maybe um, some of the interference of wells, um, water quality issues, supply issues, seasonal issues, things like that, it could be helpful to us. So just a kind of a little summary of some facts. We have springs that feed um, rivers in the summer. And we see how our groundwater is affected by our geology. Uh, that about 20-25% of our groundwater is uh, used for irrigation. A lot of people are using groundwater in our county because we don't have municipal systems, so we're, we're reliant on that in this future. And um, use patterns vary. A lot of questions about our sub areas. Connections are unclear. Quantity varies. Quality mm -hmm. varies. And some of the use patterns vary. We don't know if we, if, if things were to get added, like the bottling plant. You find a really high quality water, and they put one in. Uh, how will that affect the, the uh, use the whole that area? Because we're not looking at just a, you know, the large valley all as one piece, we're looking at eight areas, and they're kind of, in a sense, almost like neighborhoods. So if you were to draft, you know, uh, a lot out of one neighborhood, what's it going to do for that? It may not have as much an effect for the other areas around, but maybe for your sub-area, uh, that might be um, incrementally more uh, impactful. <coughs> To, to what extent is the four times acreage of stream use, um, how does it affect groundwater? Well, I think one thing we can say is the stream use for irrigation is probably not going to change a lot <coughs> because there's only so much water available, whether it's from adjudication or otherwise, from streams. If there's to be any expansion of it, it's probably going to come from groundwater. I think that's pretty safe to say. So what does our future hold? Continued use. We have seen some areas where yields have dropped. We have never heard reports of that. Will there be more? Um, some areas where we've seen interference as more wells are drilled, we're likely to see more of that. Uh, <coughs> will we see reduced inflows from springs into the Shasta River? And what could be the impact of that? Not just to the fish, but what could be the impact of reduced flows into the Shasta River for people who are depending on water from the river for their agriculture? Um, and of course, the big one we don't know is what about climate change? We know we can. I know it's my lifetime. It sure seems like it's changed. Um, you know, and it might be a positive, or it might be a negative. We we don't know yet. But I wouldn't put my money on the positive quite yet. So we're we're kind of looking for what we can do to help us understand our, our groundwater system. And a few of the things that we're looking at is if we increase our knowledge of how the aquifers function, that's of course knowledge base gives us ability to make predictions, gives us ability to 
decide where the future issues might be, especially if we overlay that with the estimates of how uh, current future water use, especially future water use. Develop a water budget, or you could call it a water balance, I suppose, that, uh, you know, we look and see, are we, are we in balance? Is it, are, are we getting into overdraft? <coughs> so that's one of the things that we want to be able to try to monitor. And um, is there any other activities that would help us to understand what our limits might be? And that's it. And that's a little project team. That's also from my back, my front yard. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, do you have any any other questions or thoughts or uh, you've, you've seen this? I think you've been thinking maybe about not just our valley, but also for yourselves. I mean, if we're like me, I mean, this is very personal to me because what's happened to me, and maybe things that happened to you or you've seen with your neighbors that will that that you could you know share with us or give us uh, insights into where we ought to go next. Yes, sir. Um, we'll see the day when we're going, but yes. my friends now would be going an opportunity to just do the green of those and sexual and drains and maintenance. Um, how are the springs holding up and even the wells and blue okay with it being would now be a good time to study how important the chastity of being full is for the water table to be up and the springs and wells to be in better shape? That you're saying because it's it's low this year? Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, one thing that that does is it gets us thinking more that we're vulnerable. Um, the um, springs and such, uh, yeah, it's, it's it would be a great thing to to be able to study. It's nice to know what the limits are. If it's if we're at a low point now, and we can see that we get increased um, precipitation and favorable conditions. How much will it come up? What happens to it? Actually, that, that's something that uh, I completely agree with you on. This is an opportunity we might as well try to take advantage of. This. What can we learn from the outlier years like this? Yeah. And if we don't try to capture data now, we may have to wait five or ten years to have another opportunity, if you want to call it an opportunity. So yes, it's, it's important. It's not something we were prepared to do because we didn't anticipate this dry year. But it's something we would like to see if we could pursue it before it starts raining. Again. So well, let's let's talk about that some more. Maybe where do we go from here? Kind of question. That's a very good where do we go from here. But what we should really try to pursue. Yes. The, <clears throat> the way in which the water is being used, both by um, irrigation and domestic. Um, like, the article that we read about what Stan uh, Sears was doing. Uh, do we have a way of um, of thinking about how that is going to change the conservation of the water that we have? Um, Dave, you have some thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, can you rephrase that for me? I, <laughs> I think it has to do with the some of the changes in use and how that might affect future water conservation and natural resources too. But it's it's Steve mentioned how it's much like a bank account. In the long run you can always spend as much as you take in. And and here if you spend a lot of your water pumping it out of the ground, you're necessarily going to see less water coming out of the ground in springs that's available for people to take water out of the river for irrigation sake. So it's one or the other, or a little of both. But you can't make new water. You can only access what's there, and to the extent that one person takes it and uses it, it may not be available for someone else somewhere else. They'll never know who or where, but there's still a fixed amount that has to somehow be distributed amongst all the people who need to use it. Yeah, I just wanted to expand on your one slide there and the points and people sharing 
their uh, experience from their wells. In your one slide where you pointed out that it's not well understood how the aquifers are interconnected. Mm -hmm. It is complex. You pointed out the eight different areas. I, I'm, I, I feel strongly it's probably more complex than eight different areas. Yeah. And I think it's very true that they probably are not well interconnected. But just sharing the experience of seeing how your neighbor's well responds when someone's irrigating, does this well not move at all, the other well goes down, just seeing how wells respond to heavy pumping will tell you a lot about how the interconnection works. So it is very important to talk with your neighbors and share any information like that. That'll help you. Yeah, wells can be, be be tested not just by pumping, but also by putting water into it. Exactly. And, and seeing how well it, it moves out to. When There's someone's pumping a well real heavy for irrigation, if it's uh, the neighbors can just drop a line and see what's happening sure. in their water and see what's going on. Yeah, monitoring, and that's one of the things that we we feel pretty strongly about that we could benefit by having more wells to monitor. There's not that many that are currently being monitored uh, that way. And that's good information, especially if you have, you know, kind of ready information, ready access to it. So you can, can say, hey, there's something going on over here. Let's check these and see what, what the mm -hmm. response is. That would be great information. Absolutely, yes. Yes. So it, it seems kind of obvious that we're lacking a huge amount of information with our water, our groundwater. So what are some of the next steps that we could do voluntarily to gather more of that data and how do we go about that? And those of us who are interested in providing that information, how do we, what's our next step? If people are interested, maybe we can make a note on the sign-up sheet and we can resurrect what we had a few years ago, which was a groundwater advisory group, people that were interested in the topic sharing what information we get either locally or from people from DWR that we're working on groundwater then, and we can perhaps put together a well monitoring grid that will target those eight sub areas better than what we currently have. We can share equipment to measure depth of water in our own wells, like first day of the month, every, every month, see what's happening so you've got baseline data so if it changes you know what it used to be and you can watch changes as they approach rather than after it's too late and the water is already below the level of your pump. Um, at some point, the, the Board of Supervisors may well form a formal groundwater advisory group for the Shasta Valley. And at that point, people that have been taking an interest in it and working together on it would be the logical people to pull from for the official groundwater advisory group for the Shasta Valley. And I would guess, as Steve mentioned earlier in his presentation, the state is pushing for continual advancement in improvements in water management and water understanding. They're, they're going to be pushing on the counties to have groundwater advisory groups in all of their groundwater areas sooner or later. It'd be good to be prepared for that. Talk to your neighbors. Talk them into allowing monitoring. Yes. Some years ago when I had a drilling company uh, out of the Auburn area, the Red Bluff Office of Water Resources contacted me knowing I was from this area. They said their biggest problem was they couldn't get anybody that would allow them to come on the property to monitor their well. They're afraid of getting shot at in those mm -hmm. cases, you know. Yeah. And uh, at least if you can keep it local and your neighbors being talked people into allowing that monitoring, that'd be a tremendous help. And we would be, be glad to sort of do the heavy lifting on that once people want to do it. You know, we can chase money for the equipment, we can, you know, sort of supply the equipment, we can host meetings, we can provide the, you know, the minute taking, the announcements, the <coughs> arranging for rooms. But we really need to have people like yourself and other people here in the room or your friends and neighbors that actually want to look into what's going on under the ground more and more and more and get to really understanding it so they, they know what to expect. Rick? Yeah, yeah I'm, uh, I'm the natural, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rick Stahl, so I'm the natural resource specialist for the county and advising the board and working with the board and people on these natural resource issues and um, as, as these guys are pointing out and, and that this thing's it, it, it's clear we, we really don't know that well what's going on and the board recognizes this problem it was also pointed out that the county is the one with uh, the responsibility to a large degree of, uh, of groundwater and um, the, the board's 
when the RCD made the presentation to the board, and Grace can fill you in on the details, but the, but the background of my working with the RCD on some of these groundwater <coughs> issues, is presenting the board with <coughs> what we know about the groundwater and who's going to do what about the groundwater. And the board is, uh, while they have the responsibility, they, they don't want to be in the position of telling people, well, this is what we're going to do. Uh, and, and they also didn't want to put the burden on the RCD for stepping into the breach and themselves being getting tarred with, oh, what are you doing with our water? What, this, what the boards hope when they pass this ordinance, creating the uh, ability for the various uh, aquifers or groundwater basins in the county to develop their own advisory committees for the board, the intent was is to have people's input from the ground up, in, you know, literally from the ground up, from the people informing the board of, of, of what they know about groundwater and how they'd like it to take place. And it's, it's clearly, it's an advisory role. There's one, the board created one in Scott Valley that is advising the board on groundwater issues and as the, the desire or whatever from the Shasta Valley <coughs> is such, that there's a local interest in forming a groundwater advisory committee and helping the board decide how to go about this. And in the Scott Valley, the decision was made either, it, the, the sense was it finally uh, resulted in the tipping point where the community decided they wanted to have their own groundwater com, uh, advisory committee, is, is that a lot of these decisions, if the community doesn't do it, they're gonna be made for the community outside of that, whether it's a state or, you know, other sorts of things that motivated and 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 at this point in, in the last meeting of the board when the RCD uh, made the presentation similar to this, or well, pretty much the same same presentation, it's the desire is to leave it in the hands of the communities to help inform the board how you want to proceed. Um, the degree that uh, the RCD is involved in all that research and just how it so this is this is really important stuff and I don't know if you want to yeah. Um, I'm Grace Bennett. I represent the Warwick area, a, a little, a small portion of um, the valley. Um, the groundwater advisory committees are just that, they're advisory committees to the board. And um, the information that the Scott Valley group collected, there were a certain amount of people that volunteered to have the wells monitored. Those wells are totally confidential. The information that is gathered is used in appropriate ways. And so if there is anybody that would like to step forward and be on an advisory committee for that, they can contact Dave and he can get everything set up. And then we as the board can appoint a, an advisory <coughs> group for the Shasta Valley, which I think would be very, very good. This presentation is really special because it does identify each the eight sections and they're like you said there's probably more sections than that of how the water flows underneath and it's and it's really really complicated and how it gets into the Shasta River and where the springs are and uh, the Nature Conservancy has done a lot of research on that aspect of it too so um, moving this forward would be a really, really good idea. And the Scott Valley watershed is so different from the from the Shasta Valley watershed that it's it's so complex in different ways than the than the um, Scott River is. And Steve Orloff is here and he's from the uh, UC Davis Property Extension. Property of Extension and he's done um, extensive research on how much water, I mean, we live in a different area, a Mediterranean climate, and he's done extensive research on the books, the textbooks say that to grow alfalfa you need so much water, and here we don't need as much water for our crops, so all of this, these, this information that will be combined needs to be combined so that we have documentations when state agencies come to us we can say okay these are these are facts that we have developed ourselves and these are the facts that 
that we believe in. And in the um, Scott Valley, we've had a, a groundwater study that's been in existence for about five years, and it's gone through uh, wet years, dry years, and they've really, really done a, a good job on that study. It's not completed yet, but it will be in the near future, and that document will be very, very important <coughs> as to what happens in that valley, and I'd really like to see the same kind of commitment for from the Shasta Valley so that we can get some really good numbers and we know what's going on. Great. That's an excellent point. Do it yourself. I worked uh, with San Joaquin County, participated in state board hearings. It's very important we do it ourselves, keep it mm -hmm. to ourselves, confidential. Don't let the state come in and do it for you. Right, do exactly. Do your own work here and work with Bill Hurd, myself, you know, Dave, everyone else. Keep it local and do our own stuff. Right, and keep the, you know, nobody, I mean, everybody is very protective of, of, their, of their water. And we need to make sure that in any kind of an advisory group that that protection is for the people that, that allow people to come in and monitor wells and do those kinds of things. So, I mean, that's, that's very, very important in all of this. And, the, you know, the, the, the deal with the board, you know, weighing in to, to controversies, just unilaterally deciding that, hey, we know what's best for people and we've decided that... Uh, People need to kind of do it themselves and impose that. That's not a, a good way to get it into the community. I mean, as a last resort and with all kinds of pressures, I'm sure the board is just going to cut them. We're going to have to step into the breach, you guys. So we're going to have to do it this way. But it really, for the purposes of being fair to the community and you know being true to the principles of a bottom-up form of government, this really. The impetus and the desire and the recognition and the support really needs to come from the community. Like you said, you got to talk to your neighbors. Cause we're, and, and you brought it up at the beginning of your point. We're talking about rights here. These are these are water Property rights, rights. Yeah. and and that is where we're really on tough thing. Clearly, throughout the West, when it comes down to the fact that people are running out of water, the courts start reining in those rights and deciding who gets what. But man, oh man, the blood, sweat, and tears that has gone in. To that, to that level of decision and bitterness, we just as soon avoid that, and and that's where it really requires people to you know take the reins in their hands and and say you know to the board saying hey look we want to do this ourselves and um, you know it's not just monitoring but if your neighbor happens to be drilling a well I was coming up the road here last week there was a rig sitting over there on the Montague Road but get talk to your neighbor who's drilling a well into letting myself or Dave or Bill or anybody, even if it's just grabbing samples, mm -hmm. putting them in a bag so we can get an idea of what's down there to mm -hmm. better define that geology that everyone's discussing. Well, that's part of the well report. You know, the well the well report, the yeah, well report. Yeah, I've, I've worked with a lot of drillers and you can't Oh, I know, I know. It's a whole lot. You know, we got to some green slime and, <laughs> and we found some brown yeah. crud. And it, I mean, it I even came back with ten little baggies full of samples yeah. that grabbed with a fairly yeah. accurate depth on it. That is, tells us so it, much. One about. of the things that with the well drillers, though, I found, you, you saw him wrestle Tweedy. He really knows his stuff and he said he'd like to, you know, work with us and, and on groundwater. <coughs> He was telling, it's, it's not just what's in the data, but it's also what's in, what's the knowledge that they have. Like, he, he, and I trust this exactly. He says, I know what I'm drilling into by the sound of the rig. I know what, what it's going through. I can tell you just from the pitch and the sound of my drill going through. And, and then when, another time he was uh, just south of Wairika, and he said he drilled through and he came up with redwood. <laughs> Drilled it right through a redwood tree about, I don't know, 100 or so feet down. Mm -hmm. Climate change. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so it's not, you know, the numbers tell you something. But I think there's an, a, yeah. an immense amount of information that can come from these well drillers that have been drilling these wells for 40 years. Absolutely. I, mean, I think mm -hmm. that they really are mine, you know, wonderful minds yeah. of information. I, I ran my own rig for seven years, so I totally agree with that, but that's true. The, the, the person on the rig does not have to be a geologist, but if at least he knows the difference between greenstone and serpentine, mm -hmm. 
it's immensely helpful. You'll have companies like Tweety's where they are that way, right. and you're going to have rip-off companies where you, their, their reports are meaningless. Right. <coughs> We, we purposely made this presentation very, very basic because everybody's starting from a different place. <clears throat> but we do anticipate that if there are people that are interested in the topic and want to get together to form a working group, we'll have future more in-depth presentations, presentations perhaps by some of the well drillers, what they're finding, what they see, what they've learned, uh, which I think will get to be quite interesting and an opportunity to build on. So if you're at all interested in, in working with us on this, uh, stick a star by your name on the, on the sign-up sheet. Let, let us know and we'll, we'll kind of keep you in the loop and as we can move this forwards, I think we'll all learn a lot and find it pretty useful and pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Let me just add one little piece to what, what Dave said. Um, Steve's talk, I'm Bill here from the RCD. Um, Steve's talk was an outgrowth of a project we did with the Department of Water Resources. And the idea was to pull together all of the available data on groundwater in the Shasta Valley, as sort of as much as it was possible. And then working with a consultant, the idea was to say, looking into the future, where are the gaps in the data, and what sort of gaps would we need to fill in in order to have a better understanding of groundwater in the Shasta Valley. And then if in the future it was decided that it would be appropriate to go out for grant funding to say, you know, we need another weather station in this part of the valley to have a better picture. So there were sort of scenarios built into that report that said if funding were sought, if we had funding at this level, here would be some of the priority things to do. And so I think that's one of the ways that the RCD can help work with folks because we already have in hand a report that sort of has an overview that sort of highlights where some of the gaps in the data are and then has some strategies going forward if you know, if an advisory group were to sit down with the county, they could say, well, here are some ideas that have been put forward. These are the things we might want to prioritize. So I think having that report uh, sort of helps the RCD maybe do a little bit of the organization at this point, a way to sort of, to sort of get with people, get people talking, get the ball rolling. And another thing, I agree with Rex. I mean, this is, this year being as, as dry as it is, we need to really, if there's anybody that has a well that is in that area out by uh, Shastina, we should get some information from you as to where your water level is as to Shastina is almost dry this year and it hasn't been that way for a very, very long time. And we've had two really bad drought years. so. We, we really should have some information about that. And um, Amy, do you have anything from Nature School Servicing about how it's affected the... the you know, I, we do have wells monitoring in all our wells. Um, mm -hmm. But I do not, Dave, do you know? I, I don't have the numbers on the top of my head. Of, of those wells are this year. We, I can get that for future reference. Yeah, but that, 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 would be, right yeah that would be really good. And, and, the, the amount of, of um, water that if you, you know, I, I go hunting and in different years, springs that are in the mountain move. They move down or they move back up. And that's, that's always been very fascinating to me that one year it could be coming out down here and the next year when it's really wet, it'll be coming out higher up on the the bank or, or on the side of the hill, and it's that's that's just always been really fascinating how how the water moves in the the levels of the land. So, I really do agree with Rex in that we should have some kind of data <coughs> this year so that we can compare it with what happens. I mean, next year. I am positive this winter we're going to have lots of snow, <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be better. So, <laughs> and if not, we can hold no. on to it. Yeah. 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 So, so um, what the two feet we should already have up there. Yeah. Right. Well, it's it's going to rain Friday. And there is new snow. And there is there's some new snow on the mountain. All right. <laughs> it's going to get better. So anyway. I can't, I can't see why you say you don't have uh, any idea of what uh, 
irrigation wells are being used or what they're pumping or anything. Because every farmer that's drilled a well for irrigation, the government has pretty much designed the irrigation system for that farmer. Good. I, I'm sure you're right, but the government also cannot tell me that information. The farmer himself has to. So even though it's in the file cabinet somewhere, I can't pull the file cabinet open and look. I'm not allowed to. And Steve, if I'm wrong, <coughs> our land, our crops here don't use the same amount as what the textbooks say should be used for those crops. Is that right? Well, our, our growing season is different than it is in other sure. areas. So we use less to grow the same crops here than we do in other areas. But one of the biggest issues is the question of how much water growers are actually applying. Because if you look at the figures for how much water alfalfa should theoretically use, the growers are applying a fair amount less than that. So the question that we're investigating now is how can you grow crops and be applying less water than what the crop should theoretically be using? I don't, I'm not working as much over here in groundwater as over in Scott Valley, so I'm not familiar with the groundwater monitoring program. What is the current groundwater monitoring program here? The GWR just have a few sites? They don't? No, they have probably about 30 wells. 30 just, wells? Yeah. It's more so extensive than the Scott yeah. Valley and, and longer, longer duration, but the grid was developed before anyone knew about the various sub basins, so they're not necessarily situated where you're tracking each sub area perhaps as you might wish. And, and what is the status over time? Is there evidence of overdraft or? No, no overdraft. Uh, uh, you know, uh, as you know, it's the last couple of years uh, it's been a drought and so levels have dropped. You know? Right. And the, it's a critical part is uh, they'll be doing it in October. They'll be coming out here. Has it bounced back? You know, how far has it dropped? You know, mm -hmm. so it's always, you know, how far it dropped in the fall and then did it bounce back up in the spring? Right. Yeah, because you guys you all know the vegetation on the foothills, when the leaves drop, groundwater levels increase. Because all the consumptive use of on the vegetation on the foothills are taking it all up. And so levels drop. So when the leaves drop, then you'll tend to see levels increase. This year is pretty w weird because we're seeing in the valley, uh, oak leaves are, oak trees are stressed out. And so the leaves are dropping, acorns are dropping. So. Does that mean groundwater levels are going to bounce up earlier? I don't know. And, and partial answer to your question too, Steve. Overdraft is a very specific term. It means every spring the water level is tending to be going down, 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 and not being fully replenished. But overdraft is not the only definition of impact. So if, for instance, the basin is small, you could use all the water up that's there in the middle of the summer and the rains could come and refill it, but everybody's well would have been dry for the last half of the summer, but it still wouldn't be overdraft if come wintertime it gets filled back up. So overdraft alone doesn't necessarily tell you what you need to know. You kind of need to know what's the trend in midsummer, what's the trend in late summer, what's the trend in the spring. And, and only one of those is going to address overdraft, but the others are going to be very important to your personal use of water when you need it in the summertime. And I have a question for you. How, in the, in the Shasta Valley, there are so many junipers. And have you calculated the, the water that the junipers pull out of the ground? I'm into? sure the U.S. Forest Service and BLM have quantities. That's, it's yeah, an issue the, and, that they and, address. But we haven't looked at it. Yeah, and um, if there's... <clears throat> There's areas that used to be field, fields and they're not, um, a crop isn't raised in that field, the junipers come in and just take over that field yeah. and grow like weeds. It's and been they, proven in fact that junipers are detrimental to tributaries because it takes flows out of them. But mm -hmm. mm. Some people say they're native, some people say they're not. And so you have a yeah. debate. Mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, just emphasizing on the rally of guys cooperating and get involved. It is an issue. California has an issue with groundwater. Tulare, as it was presented, is the worst groundwater basin in, in the state of California. It's subsiding one foot a year, continuously right now. And so my concern is, is sooner or later someone's going to have to come up, what is a safe yield for Shasta Valley? 
If someone would have told Tulare Basin 50 years ago the safe yield, they wouldn't be in the situation they are today. So the more information you get, the better off you are monitoring your well. It's not high tech. All you have to do is have an opening in your well casing, surveying tape, chalk it up, throw it down there once a month, read it, document it. Because nobody knows what's underneath the ground unless you start documenting it. Has, a, has Tulare Lake Basin, has it been full of water in any recent years? No, it's been declining, like they said, that one 19 pan. Well, I was down there and uh, spent some time down there about 1966 or 7, and it was one big lake then. Oh yeah, it used to be Tulare Lake. They used to have yeah. a steamboat that used to go from San Francisco all the way down the San Joaquin River all the way to Tulare yeah. at one time. Wow. That was a long time ago. <laughs> Still our lifetime. That's the thing, is it's still our lifetime. So it seems like a long time ago, but it's it's really a snap of the fingers to, to me. <laughs> yeah. uh, Steve? Yes. Dave was talking about the time. Look, if the water replenishes the, the wells, or the uh, groundwater and the streams each year or, or doesn't. Uh, another thing, kind of along those same lines, that I remember the RCD. Had a presentation from some people is that uh, the time that water takes, like Mount Shasta is the main source of water, I think, for Shasta Valley, it's the biggest source, is that some of the water has been examined on the mountain that comes off the mountain that is ancient in age. <coughs> you know anything about that? I don't. I, I know there's been some uh, spring studies. It's yeah. like it may be. Uh, Hundred years old. Well, you might, uh, at Nature Conservancy, probably can. I wish I had the numbers the right off the top of my head, but we did um, date date the water. And, and yeah. There are various springs on the property, and we looked at the the uh, tritium yeah. um, levels, and that will tell you how old the water is. Yeah. And you know, little springs, for example, I don't. I'm not going to remember the number of years old it is, but even just a a spring a half mile away was, you know different by 20 years in age so there and and the ages i believe were like 30 to 50 years old yes. the water so yes. that water fell on the earth so 50 any, years ago so any time you would check the water in the spring it would never be last winter's water yeah. it's going to be a long time ago mm -hmm. it takes forever to get down there. But we do, there is a report, I believe, that documents it all, and I can, I think Dave might even have a copy, but we can. Yeah, we might even want to have a presentation on, on that, too, just yeah. talk about the springs and the age of water and where it comes from and where it goes, because that's critically important, not just for groundwater people, but that's the water that feeds the surface water that all the surface irrigators rely on, too, and all the fish and everything else. And you can't ignore the importance of it. It's, it's too important to the economy of the entire watershed. I, I just, you know, and I, you know, like Dave said, I mean, agriculture is damn near just the entire life, economic lifeblood of this county that we're we're trying to preserve. And I don't, we're not at a crisis point yet to where uh, I don't think anybody is going to be rushed into doing something that uh, at this point that the data or anything doesn't, you know, doesn't justify. The thing is. Is, is to get in front of these things before their crisis. What, what happens in this America, America and their place around is, is that people wait until it's a crisis point. And, and it, clearly it's not that, but we do want to preserve, you know, agriculture and we do want to, you know, preserve <coughs> people's rights to, the, to their water. And there's so few people, and I think it, my personal feeling is that there's uh, little enough demand that we can accommodate the existing uses, but it's just it's getting getting in front of a, a potential crisis. And 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 you talked about uh, you know water bottling and stuff. Projects like that, those are discretionary projects, and the county has to permit them, and they have to go through the California Environmental Quality Act, and they would have to analyze um, the, the that particular use. So where you have a discretionary project. Um, you know the, the the motivation or fear of water bottling plant isn't doesn't need to be a, a motivating factor for everybody because that's taken care of in the 
in the CEQA process like, you know, in Nestle uh, that, that went on through that. So that's not the issue. But more to the point is uh, the ability of, of agriculture and, and domestic users to be secure in their water <coughs> ahead of any crisis motivating people from outside the county and outside the users of this area to start telling them what to do with their water. It also can provide a, a better basis for decision making for people that are thinking about drilling additional wells. You know, is there sufficient water there to justify the expense or will I simply be in competition with my neighbors and find I've got a hole that doesn't yield more than the hole I've got? And, and I, I should think again about whether I invest in a large well if, if the available water simply isn't there or if the lift is going to be so high that it costs me more than I can grow it. And that sort of information, too, helps keep people from making <coughs> poor decisions because they had no information to base it on. I don't see how this is going to help that much. Because I can drill a well right there, 50 feet over, you'll never get water. Some places are like that. Yeah. So, you know, that information is really not going to help that much. Perhaps not right here, but it may not be like that everywhere in the whole watershed. You know, definitely there are places around here where you can get lots of stories from neighbors saying, yeah, I put a well in here and I got nothing. And I moved over here and I got an artesian well that the water came out all by itself. Yeah. And they weren't that far apart. I know a well with 600 gallons a minute and 50 feet away from it, there wasn't one drop of water yes. in 400 feet. And, and that's sort of the, 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 the residue of that giant debris flow and everything all tumbled up. And some places there are passageways for the water and other places there aren't. And just knowing where where you encounter that sort of a situation also kind of tells you where it's a crapshoot and where it's a sure thing. That could be a dangerous situation too because that reservoir you hit might be very small. When you finish yeah. that $150,000 well and it goes dry after one season, you got a bigger problem. But, but you're right. There, there's no universal answer that good here, bad here, invariably. Uh, 200 feet down there, count on it. But there's a lot that can be learned by sharing information. And you know, if all you learn is an area is erratic, you know more than you knew before. Okay, well I think uh, our hours are up. I really appreciate your coming out to, to hear this and, and to join. And uh, I think we all uh, really appreciate your comments. They're wonderful. And if you have uh, things to share with us uh, or you want to get involved, uh, please uh, let us know and uh, make yourself available and talk to your neighbors and maybe we can uh, do exactly what Rick is saying and do things that will help us keep ahead of the curve before it becomes crisis. Thank you very much. <laughs>